car for the month of December. We have been organizing this webinar series to promote physics and its application and also to aware the public on hot key topics related to science and technology. Before start the session, I kindly request the participant to keep your microphones muted during the session and we will give time and uh, time at the end of the se uh, session to ask if you have any questions. Uh, during the session, you can type your questions on the chat so that moderator can point these questions after the talk. Today we have invited one of the best person to speak on fabrication of nanoparticle based sensors using lasers under the topic cooking nanoparticle soups with lasers that is Dr. Lak Lakmal Veeravarna from University of Colombo. First of all let me uh, welcome Dr. Lakmal on behalf of the Institute of Physics Sri Lanka we are honored by your presence and I sincerely thank you for accepting our invitation with your busy schedule. Before formally start the talk, let me call upon uh, Dr. Gayan Ile Peruma uh, to introduce the speaker to the audience. Over to Gayan. Thank you, Professor Sira. It is my great pleasure to introduce our guest lecturer today, Dr. Lakmal Veeravarna. Uh, Dr. Darshan Lakmal Veeravarna received his BSc Honours degree in Engineering Physics in 2010 from the University of Colombo. He completed his MSc in Physics at the State University of New York at Binghamton in 2014 and his PhD in Physics in 2017. His graduate research work focused on nonlinear laser matter interaction, femtosecond time free of spectroscopy, and laser sintering of heat sensitive substrates for printed flexible electronic manufacturing. After his doctoral studies, he joined the Center of Advanced Microelectronics Manufacturing, CAM, of Binghamton University as a first doctoral fellow, where he specialized in flexible electronics design flexible electronic design, fabrication, and reliability testing. During his postdoctoral research, he closely worked with renowned industry partners such as General Electric, Lockheed Martin, Viewpoint, and etc. on advanced elect uh, flexible electronics for medical and defensive applications. Currently, he works as a senior lecturer in the Department of Physics at the University of Colombo. Please warmly welcome Dr. Darshan Lekmal Veeravarna for today's guest lecture. Over to you, Dr. Darshan. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's good to see some familiar names. So let me start with a very simple question. So how many of you would like the feel of a paper? Maybe when reading a research article or a book or maybe a newspaper? any material printed on paper. Well, at least I personally prefer a paper version of whatever I read. Not because I'm incompetent in handling an electronic version of it, simply because I like that live feeling I get when reading a printed paper. Maybe because I indirectly contribute to killing a living tree by printing a document on a paper. Well, that being said, we are yet to witness the easiness of handling an electronic version of a document when we print it on a paper. We cannot search for keywords on a printed article, nor can we see any live animations or hear any sound on the printed article. However, we are not far away from that realization. So far, we have developed paper thin versions of electronic displays that we can roll and bend. And also, we know how to print them roll to roll. We manufacture such displays roll to roll just like printing newspapers roll to roll. 
we have electronics printed on paper that are being used in many biological applications. We just have to bridge these technologies together to unveil an article printed on a piece of paper with all the luxury of an electronic version of that. Unfortunately, we cannot use conventional microfabrication techniques on papers because high temperature, pressure, and harsh chemicals used in such microfabrication processes will simply destroy the paper. So in this talk, I will share with you some of the unconventional techniques used to fabricate electronics on paper, especially how we use a laser to make conductive traces on paper. When talking about paper, the very first thing that comes to my mind is origami because it uses papers. I'm sure at some point in your life, you have created some paper arts like this, maybe a small paper boat or somewhat complex folding pattern, such as the origami crane shown in this picture. There's a sad story about a thousand origami cranes that most of you might have heard of. A little girl was sick and she was making thousands such cranes, hoping for being healed. In one version, version of the story, she died before completing thousand cranes. So what's so special about the substrate or the paper that we use for this origami? When you fold the substrate and apply pressure on the fold, the substrate should be creased. It should hold the crease as well. Figure onto the left hand side shows making use of such creased papers to form some artistic decorations. Now imagine doing the same creasing with a piece of polythene. Well, trust me, it's going to be difficult because compared to a paper, a polythene would not hold the crease. On the other hand, if the substrate is so thin, we can easily fold multiple folds onto each other and make some complex folding patterns. Paper being thin can be easily used to do that compared to some thick substrate such as cardboard. Also, we can take pieces of papers and roll them to form attractive paper arts similar to what's shown on the right hand side of the picture. So that's the specialty of paper used in this origami. It would be nice if we can make use of such papers that are foldable and roll rollable to make electronics that we can fold and roll that would take us closer to realization of an animated printed paper. The whole research domain of flexible electronics is trying to do just that, making functional electronics on flexible substrates, not just paper, but any flexible substrate. By printing conductors on a substrate and mounting electronics on top of that. For example, shown is a picture of a device fabricated on a transparent flexible substrate with a display and some functional electronics. You can take such flexible electronic circuits and bend them. You can stretch them, you can twist them, fold them. Electronics would still perform as desired. They will conform to various surfaces, any complex 3D surface. For example, human body, which is a complex surface. You can take this type of electronics and put them on the body. The electronics, because they are flexible, would be conformed to the surface easily. And also they can be made transparent, biocompatible, 
and lightweight, still with very low cost. Personally, I am fascinated about the degrees of freedom we get by the conformability of such flexible electronics. There are structures where we cannot fabricate electronics on. For example, think of a blade of a wind turbine. We cannot print any electronics over there. It's a huge structure. We cannot take them inside a fabrication facility to make electronics on that. In such cases, we can print electronics on flexible substrates and simply stick them onto the structure of interest. Since they are conformable, they will conform and take the shape of the structure, just like pasting a sticker. That's how easy the electronics would be with flexible electronics. Here is an example of a flexible version of an Arduino board. Not that anyone would need it, just because we can, someone has printed it. It has multiple layers. The bottommost layer is a flexible substrate. In this case, it is actually a transparent flexible substrate. On top of the substrate, they have printed conductive traces using some form of a special conducting ink. Those are those tiny wires that you can see. Then some conductive adhesive material is used to place electronic components on the circuit pad, so conductive traces. Eventually, a non-conducting dielectric layer, which is shown by this kind of a green or blue color, is printed over the entire circuit for the protection. Some of the electronic components are specially designed. They are very thin. When you flex the surf circuit, the electronics bend as bend together with the surface. So that's the ingredients of a flexible circuit. The paper that we have been discussing so far has a unique set of properties that are ideal for electronic fabrication. Unfortunately, not using conventional techniques. We have to come up with some advanced or novel techniques to do the electronic fabrication. But paper has this unique set of properties. Now, how many of you have used litmus paper? Maybe in your fifth grade or sixth grade, most of us have used litmus paper. If you dip a piece of litmus paper into a liquid, it will change the color of the paper based on the pH of the liquid. The paper itself acts as the sensor. By looking at the color of the paper, we can detect the pH. So the color signal that the paper gave was the sent signal. It not just changed the color on the surface, but the whole volume of the paper changes the color. So it's kind of a volume sensing. So in other words, the effective sensing area is larger when we use such types of paper for sensing. Shown in the picture is a scanning electron microscope image of a special paper substrate that's called GE fiberglass paper. But any regular paper would have a similar type of structure. You can see the multiple layered structure of, and also the porosity of the paper. Now, any chemicals that are sensitive to some material can go into the bulk through this porous nature. It can be flexible that you can bend and fold this paper. You can find paper anywhere, it's very cheap. And also it's biodegradable, so you can just dump in into garbage. Compared to most of the polymer substrates, it's eco-friendly. On the other hand, I, at least I haven't heard of anyone allergic to paper, though I have seen people allergic to some plastics and rubber.
So looking at this specific structure of a paper, we can see very ideal solution, ideal cases for fabricating electronics on this type of a paper. So let's make paper-based sensor. As shown in this picture is the layered structure of a very simple paper-based sensor. On the bottommost layer is the paper substrate. It can be any paper, just a regular A4 paper or a paper that you use to print stickers or photographs or anything. Just any suitable paper which has some form of a porosity would work. Then on top of the paper, we print a pattern called an interdigitated electrode using a conductive ink. This interdigitated electrode is just like your two hands, fingers crossed, but fingers do not touch each other. Most of the inks that we use are non-conducting soon after printing. So we need to dry out the ink and heat it up to make it conducting. However, the heating is challenging when we use heat sensitive substrates like paper. So we will see what alternative techniques we can use to heat up the ink and make it conductive. Now, after having the conductive layer, interdigitated electrode, a material which is sensitive to what we want to sense. Maybe we want to sense an iron or maybe we want to sense a gas. That particular chemical is deposited over the fingers. That's shown in that bottommost layer. Things like rambutan is that nanoparticle or nano uh, whatever organic layer used for sensing. The once the material is exposed to the chemical that we intend to sense, the resistance or the capacitance of the sensor measured across the arms of the electrode would change. We can calibrate the sensor by exposing it to known amounts of sensing chemicals and record the response. Then we can use that known response to find an unknown amount of chemical present just by looking at the capacitance or the resistance. These type of sensors are widely used in many gas sensing and other biological sensing applications. Now, the first thing would be to find the paper, which is we already have. The next thing would be to find a suitable ink. So let's look at Conductive inks, conductive inks in general, and that can be used to print an interdigitated electrode pattern on a piece of paper. Now, I normally call these kind of inks a nanoparticle soup. It has so many things in it working together to achieve a desired property, a desired conductivity. No one except for the manufacturer really knows what's inside it. However, in general, most of the inks consist of metallic nanoparticles of different type, maybe silver, copper, or any other conductive metallic nanoparticle. And they have various shapes and sizes. In this pictorial example, I have shown a spherical nanoparticle. They are suspended in a liquid medium, maybe water or any other organic solvent. The nanoparticles are decorated by using additives and stabilizers. Now these additives prevent nanoparticles from contacting with each other before we put it down on a substrate. There are other organic additives as well to ensure the adhesion of the ink onto various substrate. Working with paper, the adhesion is not that difficult to achieve, but when you work with 
substrates such as polymer based substrates the adhesion is problematic we need to enhance the adhesion by adding few additives to the conductive nanoparticle soup now again once you put this down on a piece of paper or any material it won't be conductive we have to make it conductive by somehow what so special about nanoparticles now one thing we know is that properties of matter change from their bulk as we decrease the size of particles for example in this graph i have plotted the melting point of a spherical silver nanoparticle as a function of particle radius the x axis in the graph is particle radius in nanometers y axis is the melting temperature in kelvin what is interesting is that at smaller particle sizes i am referring to less than about 5 nanometers the reduction in melting point compared to the bulk is significant bulk silver for example has a melting point of about 960 celsius but at nano dimensions we can melt a silver nanoparticle at around 120 celsius that's a significant reduction in melting point we call this melting point depreciation now this reduction in melting point is ideal when dealing with heat sensitive substrates for electronics fabrication for sure we cannot heat the heat sensitive material too much to make the the ink conductive if we can reduce the melting point of the constituents of the ink below the damage threshold of the substrate then we can safely heat up the substrate to make the ink conductive so that's basically the important one key benefit of having nanoparticles we can make the ink conductive without damaging the heat sensitive substrate moreover the surface electrons of nanoparticles exhibit this collective oscillation known as surface plasmons we can apply an external electric field most of the time in the form of a laser light to excite these plasmons and achieve resonance provided that the applied laser frequency or the wavelength is matched with the oscillation frequency of the surface electrons the electric field around a 5 nanometer diameter silver nanoparticle dispersed in water and irradiated by a 420 nanometer wavelength laser is shown on the left hand side picture that's just an electric field plot two dimensional i hope you can easily see that the electric field on the surface of the nanoparticle is enhanced that is just the bright yellow color this indicates an effective coupling of the energy of matching frequency light if you look at how this particle absorbs light at different frequencies so different wavelengths we can see a distinct peak at a specific wavelength as shown on the right hand side picture the right hand side graph is the wavelength on x axis absorb absorbance on the y axis as you can see for this particular nanoparticle that is silver actually around 420 nanometer wavelength there is a peak in absorption that is that resonance peak at this specific frequency or wavelength the particle nanoparticle fully absorbs the light energy passing negligible amount of energy onto the substrate therefore minimizing the heat damage to the substrate so with nanoparticle soups or inks we have two plus signs 
one is that inherently the nanoparticles have lower melting temperatures and also we can use a laser to selectively heat it and effectively provide the energy for heating without damaging the substrate so now we have the conductive ink in hand so how do we deposit this into the substrate so how do you write something on a piece of paper just by using a pencil or a pen right well we can take an empty ballpoint pen and load it with a nanoparticle ink then just hand write your electronics on a piece of paper that would work if you need to make things a little bit complicated we can fix that pen onto the arm of a robot and program the robot to write the electronic pattern and unfortunately we cannot achieve high resolution using such techniques because the lines that we draw using a regular ball pen point ball point pen would be a little bit wider than what what is required for this kind of an application there are many advanced manufacturing techniques to print electronics on paper so let me share one such technique with you which is rich of physics very simple physics now shown here is a schematic diagram of a process called aerosol jet printing it has few different components in it as you can see there's a flow air flow called atomizer flow which is usually nitrogen we pass it through a narrow opening as you can see there's a small channel like this and it opens up to the out output here within the container there's a second channel a narrow channel starting from somewhere here i hope you can see my pointer going down to the ink container now just because we know physics simple physics the air flow uh, velocity at the opening of the nozzle or the opening of this point here makes a pressure difference between the bottom of the ink and the top of the channel up here therefore the ink would suck up through the channel and then the air atomizer air flow would spray this ink as a mist of air just droplets of ink so we call this process atomization of course it's not breaking down to atoms but the terminology is called atomization now once we create such a mist of ink we the same atomizer flow takes that ink through external tubing to a deposition head we call a nozzle there's some special physics going on inside the second part of this process called virtual impactor here now what happened is smaller droplets usually have lower momentum they can easily get deviated from a straight trajectory those deviating from a straight trajectory would hit the wall of the virtual impactor the only small center opening of the virtual impactor will allow the larger droplets to pass through which have higher momentum so once they pass through the virtual impactor further along the line we have a nozzle inside the nozzle we use a gas flow we call it sheath flow to set the size of the size of the ink stream we call aerodynamically focusing or defocusing the ink stream so we can change the width of the circular ink stream below about 6 mm height we have the platform where we need to print the circuit so we call that distance 6 mm the standoff distance usually this 
stage or the substrate that we need to print on is positioned on a movable platform where you can move it in x and y direction and in sophisticated cases you can move the entire system in five axis and then print your required electronics in a coordinated motion pattern usually we can go get down to about 10 micron resolution in best case and also because this is about six millimeters up in air it's not that sensitive to surface variations of the substrate therefore it is ideal for printing electronics on paper substrate so let me show you an example of a example use of such uh, printing method so here is a simple video i hope you can see it yes we initially create the something called a tool path using a software and then we print it onto a substrate now in this example the globe the world map is printed on a globe the machine here uh, called aerosol jet printer has five degrees of freedom that you can move around so the 3d object is moved around in five axis and you print your conductive ink onto the substrate but in our case we simply use very simple electronics and simple two-dimensional patterns on a piece of paper there are other printing methods available depending on the paper and the type of ink we use if we intend to print something print an ink of low viscosity we can use a jetting or spraying mechanism an inkjet printer similar to your desk, desktop printer would be capable of printing a conductive ink on a piece of paper aerosol jet printer that's my personal favorite is a spraying type technique you can print electronics using both methods even narrower than human hair uh, go down to about 10 micron resolution if the ink has consistency of motor oil still aerosol jet printing can handle it if the ink that you want to print is of consistency of tomato sauce you can use some form of a syringe dispensing mechanism or screen printing meaning you can squeeze the ink through a needle or a mesh the screen printing is the same technique that you use to print uh, t-shirts using these two methods you can achieve about 100 micron resolutions and in screen printing if the technique is sophisticated you can go down to about 50 micron but very challenging now we have the ink and we deposited it onto a piece of paper once we put down this ink or the soup i told you that it's not conducting so we need to cook the nanoparticle soup in this multi step procedure shown in the picture a to b to c to d that we try to make the ink conducting we first have to evaporate all the solvent in the ink so once we evaporate ink we get get rid of the blue color liquid solvent then we should further evaporate the organic additives those are the sticky things now the nanoparticles can come closer to each other and touch them to form conducting traces further heating would result in welding of these nanoparticles technically we call this necking or neck formation in most of the cases we can use a convection oven something similar to what you use for baking cakes to make these inks conductive unfortunately not with heat sensitive substrates such as paper that's where a laser comes in handy handy you can cook the nanoparticle soup with a laser a laser with matching frequency though since at a matching frequency 
almost all the energy is absorbed by the nanoparticles, we can assure minimal heat damage to the substrate. Here I summarize some of our printing and cooking activities on paper substrates. The figure on the left hand side shows a photograph of a printed trace. That's a silver nanoparticle printed trace. And also the cross-sectional profile shown in the red line on the graph. Approximately, this is about 70 micron wide, 15 micron thick, 10 millimeter long conductive trace. Then we use a continuous wave laser with, in this case, actually 820 nanometer wavelength to cook this trace. The technical term for cooking in this case is called laser sintering. Note that in this case, the laser wavelength does not match the resonance wavelength of silver. Resonance is around 420, we use 820. Therefore, it is guaranteed that we would burn the substrate if we increase the laser energy too much. So we connect our laser to a moving head and translate it over the trace at different speeds and different powers, laser powers. The graph on the right hand side shows you what happened to the conductivity of such traces after we cook them using our laser. Now here the x-axis of the graph is the laser power in milliwatt, y-axis is the conductivity of the trace as a percentage of bulk. A 0% indicates non-conducting, 50% indicates half as conductive as the bulk, 100% means conductivity of bulk. Now we use three laser speeds, one, five, 10 millimeters per second, shown by red, blue, and black colors. Of course, you can use many different speeds you would like, as long as the system supports. We use four laser powers, 100, 300, 600, and 900 milliwatt. These were decided based on something called an design of experiment. Of course, we can use very different options as well. What we can see is that the conductivity increases when we increase the sintering power of the laser. As you go along the x-axis to the right-hand side, you can see that the conductivity increases. On the other word, on other words, the conductivity increases with increasing effective laser energy, meaning that x-axis is in power, but since it is associated with the moving speed, you can calculate an effective energy. So with the effective energy, if you increase it, the conductivity increases as well. The speed, if you reduce the speed, the conductivity increases again because the effective energy increases. Furthermore, at the higher energy end, you can see an increase in trend, but that trend is saturating. And there's a reason, let's see why. So we need to observe this conductive trace under a high magnifying microscope, in this case, an SCM, scanning electron microscope, to see what's going on inside the trace that contributes to this change in conductivity. On the left-hand side, I show some of the micrographs of the conductive trace at different energies and speeds. At relatively lower laser energies, for example, 100 milliwatt at 10 millimeters per second, that is the second picture on the first row, 10, 100 milliwatt, 10 millimeters per second. The microstructure shows not much difference compared to an as printed trace. As printed trace means you just print it and let it dry. You don't do any heat treatments. That is the first micrograph. So between first and second micrograph, there's not much difference. 
means that we simply increase the evaporation of the organics, but nothing much. That is at lower laser energies. At relatively moderate laser energies, for example, 600 millivolt at five millimeters per second, that is the second row first image, you can see a clear difference between that and the microstructure of an as printed trace. You can see that the particle sizes are bigger now. That is called grain growth. The size is bigger. And also there's an improved neck forming, the welding of particles together. So we increase the neck formation and welding just at moderate energies. At relatively higher energies, for example, the fourth picture, we see further increase in grain growth and neck formation. However, there are some dark spots visible on the trace. Those are possible heat damage to the substrate and also other effects causing delamination of the ink from the paper. The heat damage is not good, delamination is not good. So this is an interplay between two counteracting phenomena, increased necking versus heat damage that causes the conductivity to saturate at higher energies. Such cooked paper-based sensors have many applications in sensing. We just have to change the chemical we deposit over the electrodes. We can make them sensitive to gases, ions, or you can use it to sense sweat and analyze sweat and maybe glucose sensing. Now, for example, here in this picture, two pictures, we together with our partners at uh, General Electric Global Research, General Electric Healthcare, and DuPont once made a wearable patch that is analyzing sweat and monitoring sweat rate. Now, parts of electronics were printed on a paper-based substrate. A paper-based wicking material and some microfluidic channels guide the sweat to the analyzing electronics. So while you exercise or doing some physical activities, we can monitor the sweat rate and sweat and analyze the sweat to detect any malfunctioning in your body. So summarizing what we have discussed so far, paper substrates have unique properties suitable for flexible electronics manufacturing. Even though we cannot use conventional nanofabrication techniques, there are various new additive fabrication techniques coupled with techniques such as laser sintering, we can effectively use to fabricate electronics on paper. If you have such paper-based platforms and an array of selective materials, then you are on the trending end of flexible electronics. With that, I acknowledge our partners and new funding agencies. All the work discussed here, physical work, were carried out at the Center for Advanced Microelectronics Manufacturing at Binghamton University. Of course, I'm affiliated to the Department of Physics, University of Colombo. Thank you very much. And these are some of the references if anyone would be interested in. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lakmal. Uh, uh, now, the, uh, now it is open for discussion. So the participant can uh, forward their questions in two ways. So the one one of the way is uh, so you can write your question on the chat so can uh, so the one of us can uh, point it to the speaker and also you can uh, raise your hand by uh, clicking on the raise hand option in the chat so that is the other way or if there are nobody uh, so you can directly ask the uh, question from the speaker so this uh, so to conduct this uh, question and answer session, uh, I would like to invite uh, the Joint Secretary of IPSL, Dr. Gayanile Peruma, uh, to conduct the session. Uh, 
Over to you, Gaya. Uh, thank you, Professor Sir. So as uh, our president has mentioned, so now uh, this presentation is open for the questions. I'm sure you had learned a lot, so you must have some questions and some ideas. So it's open. So let's see about them. Uh, Lakmal, may I ask a question? Sure. Uh, so Lakmal, so uh, this is mainly done, I believe, during your PhD work. Uh, is there something happening uh, in Sri Lanka or something like that? Or is there some kind of research where the interested people can come and join or do something? This was done during my postdoctoral work. So right now, we at the Department of Physics at Sri Lanka, we are doing the design work and also doing the, for example, now, if you have a complicated sensor with electronics mounted on it, we do the material selection, design of the electronics, and then we have some form of electronic fabrication available here. And then we do the prototyping and we communicate with our collaborators and do the fine tuning and reliability testing as well meaning you just bend this for a thousand times so many million times and see how the sensor is working and then improve the reversions as the electronics is progressing towards a reliable form. So we have some form of printing capabilities and also of course all forms of design capabilities and we are working on such electronics design, development, and reliability testing locally at the Department of Physics. Thank you, Lakmal. I think that's a great news for everyone. Uh, and may I remind you of uh, something extra? We are collecting your feedback uh, about this lecture series. So uh, in your chat, you might see a link to give the feedback. So when you feel free or at the moment, uh, please give us the feedback so we can improve upon uh, this kind of uh, webinar series. So let's go back to the discussions again. So uh, anyone? Blackmal, um, uh, can I ask a question from you? I'm Kapila. Sure. Blackmal, uh, uh, it was a great uh, discussion, but there's a question uh, that I have in my mind. How do you treat the, uh, I mean, I'm talking about the laser treatment. So you make uh, ink layers, right? So how do you treat those layers specifically? I mean, how, how do you how do you irradiate the laser beam onto those uh, to those ink layers? Do you select them or you just uh, I don't know. It, it wasn't clear to me. <clears throat> yeah. So this is basically focusing the laser onto mm -hmm. the printed trace and moving the laser beam along the trace. So you basically heat the entire surface of the printed trace. Yeah, so what is the, uh, the beam width? Now in this case, we were using an 80 micron beam diameter, which was oh, enough okay. to cover the entire size of the so it doesn't beam. Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't damage uh, terribly to the paper? It does not, but okay. in our case, since we were off the resonance, there was some absorption of heat onto the paper. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we could not go too high energies without uh, damaging the substrate. So there is some form of uh, damage at higher powers. Okay, so, uh, so the laser beam is kind of automated or you just manually move it? How does it happen? It's automated. It is automated. So basically, it is running along the same path that we use for printing the conductive ink. So okay. you basically run the same program, change the head to the from the nozzle to the laser. So it goes over the the laser goes over the printed trace, uh, except for the 
No, yeah, sir. yeah, that's clear. One more question, Lakma. Is it uh, a pulse laser beam? I wasn't sure whether you mentioned that one. Is it just a yeah, continuous laser? A CW laser, continuous wave laser. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. It's a, it's a good thank discussion. You. Thanks. Ryan, uh, so there are a lot of uh, comments that uh, the feedback uh, link is not working. Uh, I don't know whether we can take any step to uh, rectify that. Uh, Gayan, can you hear me? Uh, yes, Professor, sir. I, I, I got the notice. Yeah. I'm checking on it. Okay. Uh, but I think most of you had registered for this particular lecture. So in that case, we can send back the uh, feedback form a little bit later. Okay. And uh, I just send you a new link. Hopefully it will work. And uh, at the same time, I also have a question. Uh, uh, so my question is, uh, so you are using this plasma resonance uh, for this laser heating process, no? Yes. Uh, so, uh, so this, uh, the total energy that absorb uh, due to this uh, plasma resonance, is it converted to heat only uh, into the heat? Or can there be any other form of uh, energy? transformation now in this case actually we were off the resonance mm. so it is heating the nanoparticles and also the substrate but at the exact resonance you are only heating the nanoparticles and as far as i know the all the energy of the laser is converted to heat because this particular uh, phenomena is sometimes using uh, this uh, solar cells also which I am working on so we are also making uh, uh, this nanoparticles and use that uh, this uh, plasma resonance to excite the nanoparticles and transfer uh, uh, some electrons from it to the it to some other particles uh, connected with the uh, nanoparticle uh, so to generate a current uh, like uh, it work as an uh, excitor. Right. In this case, uh, the main purpose of using the laser is to convert as much as energy to heat as possible. As possible. Yeah. So there are time for others also to uh, quote their questions. Uh, Uh, and I yeah. think now the form is working back. Okay. It's a small technical issue, but uh, I think now it's. Can I, can I ask one question? Sure. Sure. This, I think the plasma resonance is more prominent on the surface, uh, around the surface, right? Yeah. So, will it affect uh, the property of the material that you are producing for sensing purpose? Now, in my case, in our case, actually, we are heating the conductive ink layer and that is the, the sensing material is placed after printing the conductive layer and after heating the conductive layer so we don't shoot the laser while we have the sensing material on i it. think that sound is not uh... I hear only very weak, yeah, no. I mean, feeble sound. Oh, it's very, I think, for some reason, my sound is very uh, low volume. Okay, okay. Actually, in this case, I think you need to hit only on the surface, because if it uh, penetrates into the substrate, uh, it gets damaged, no? So that's the purpose of using uh, the laser. Right. So we, uh, again, uh, just uh, sorry about my uh, mic being kind of uh, fuzzy. So the idea was that uh, we print the conductive layer, the conductive electrode, and make it conductive using the laser. Then only we deposit the sensing material. So mm -hmm. we don't heat the sensing, sen uh, sensing material using the laser. 
Uh, Dr. Lakmal, there's a question from one of the audience. Uh, he's asking whether it is possible to use gold nanoparticles instead of silver nanoparticles. Yes, for sure. Yes, we can. The only uh, bad news is it is kind of expensive. Sil uh, compared to silver, gold is expensive. But I have seen uh, people making composite nanoparticles. The core is something different. And the outskirt is another material that will give you a reduced cost. But for sure, you can use uh, gold nanoparticles. But the resonance will be slightly different. So you have to use an appropriate laser. Or if you don't worry too much about the heat damage, you can get up to moderate energies using an IR laser. Any more questions from the audience or from the anyone? Either you can say it audio, through audio or you can type it in the chat. Any other questions? I think this is a great opportunity for you to get any something clarified because he's a very good in this particular area. So Lakmal, have you started uh, any work related to this area in after coming back uh, to Sri Lanka and uh, working in the university, uh, giving uh, projects and other things to the students? Yes, we are uh, right now actually focusing on reliability testing of such electronics, uh, then applications in uh, not specifically this area, but in environmental conservation applications. Actually, a lot of students are also joining with us today. I think uh, this is a great opportunity uh, for them to uh, get to know Dr. Rakmal uh, and maybe uh, you can meet him and uh, if you want to continue your higher uh, studies or do a MSc or anything uh, which need a project. So I think uh, he will be able to help you. Uh, so are there any more questions? Uh, if there are no more, uh, so we have come to the end of the session and uh, I think that is a very good question that we had today. So we wind up, uh, I would like to invite uh, the questions of the the vote of thanks. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Lakmal Viravarne, uh, for being with us and sharing your knowledge uh, regarding the cooking of uh, nanoparticle soups with lasers. It's, it was very interesting. Uh, I've been uh, listening to you and uh, very fascinating uh, piece of things that uh, we got to know. So thank you once again. And also, I would like to thank uh, the Council of the uh, Institute of Physics to organize such a thing as uh, especially uh, I wish to thank the organizing committee uh, all the way from uh, 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 Dr. Chaturi and Dr. Ilai Peruma, uh, Dr. Jayatilaka, as well as Professor, our president, Professor Susir Perra for organizing such an event and uh, also, I would like to say that uh, we hope to uh, continue this series uh, every month. So uh, please tune in and uh, it will be uh, advertised, the specific date and the uh, 
a speaker will be advertised and thank you once again for all uh, who joined today and uh, uh, so we can wind it wind up it's raining here <laughs> a little bit of heavy rain uh, over to uh, professor susila yes uh, thank you uh, uh, dr chintaka uh, so with that closer remarks uh, we'll wind up the sessions uh, thanking uh, once again uh, dr lakmal for uh, his valuable contribution uh, and uh, th i will i would like to thank all the participants also uh, who join us join with us today and uh, have a very uh, pleasant evening to all of you thank you thank you